Welcome to the second day of GPIC 2021 and to the fifth session titled Unlocking Markets to Crowd in Private Finance for Climate Projects. My name is Henry Gonzalez and I am the director of GCF's private sector facility. I am honored to moderate this panel alongside Rohus Momart, CEO of Responsibility Investments, Dr. Dante Mosi, Executive President of the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, CABE, Anita George, Executive Vice President and Deputy Head of La Caisse de Depot et Placement du Quebec, CDPQ Global, Hong Thieu Peters Patterson, CFO and Director, Division Support Services of GCF, and Victoria Miles, Managing Partner, Delphos International. The session will focus on the role of GCF and other investors in using scarce public resources to unlock high impact climate projects and crowd in private finance through a suite of risk bearing financial instruments. In addition, the session will explore innovative ways of blending public resources with private finance and how these investments could reduce the perceived and real risks faced by private investors in early stage climate solutions and markets. The session will also explore the pivotal role of GCF catalytic capital, first loss equity, first loss guarantee, anchor investments, etc., in greening the financial systems, developing capital markets for transition and climate finance at scale. Prior to starting, allow me to remind you of a few housekeeping matters. Live remote interpretation in French and Spanish is available. Participants are invited to select the language in which they would like to follow the entire session by clicking on the interpretation button at the end of your streaming window. Automated live captioning is available to several languages. Please note the link in the session description within WUVA, our conferencing platform. Full video recording of the session will be available on WUVA after the session and later on the events page. We hope that you will find this session useful. And again, we invite you to submit your questions or comments in writing throughout the session in the Q&A function on WUVA. Allow me now to uh, you know, engage in a conversation. And I would like to actually bring uh, Rohus Momart to the discussion. Rohus, Responsibility Investments has been a pioneer in climate finance in developing countries for the past decade. Um, you've worked in areas regarding energy efficiency, energy access, agriculture, and technology. Could you please tell us a little bit about your journey and when structuring those funds and facilities, what has been the success factors or the challenges to make capital flow into responsibilities investments? Over to you. Now it should work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Henry. Thank you. Um, no, but thank you very much for, 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 for having me here and, and, and sharing a bit our, our experiences over the last 10 years. Just two words at the framework for those who are not familiarized with responsibility. So we are an impact asset management house based in Switzerland, uh, active in the field since 20 years. Yes, rightly so, Henry, 10 years specifically focused on climate, uh, manage around 4 billion and one third of those 4 billion is dedicated to climate finance or let's say uh, smart climate financing solutions. What we have been doing uh, over the last 10 years is really uh, focusing on the big topic, of course, on mitigation. For us, it means to the very large extent doing really energy efficiency projects. And I come in a second and I explain what have been the success factors there. Then we are also active in the field of adaptation with specific solution uh, for agriculture focused companies there. Um, and at the same time, for us, it's very important. It's not only on emission reduction and adaptation, it is also on creating access to finance, to energy, as we know, and you know, has been pointed out so often, you know, there are still around 700 million people without any access. Uh, to, uh, to energy or electricity solutions. So we have also to care, of course, for those and to make that happen. Now, when I look at all the, the, the different, when we say solutions or products, uh, which we have been launching, I have to state, and I was going over this, of course, just uh, in preparation, but it, of course, very clear. In each of those, we have public-private partnerships. So currently, I think it's very important first statement. Currently, we see already, of course, there is significant and huge interest of the private sector of also entering into the field. 
However, the specifics where we are focusing, we focus exclusively on emerging or developing countries. So we have, of course, a segment where the private sector, where capital is even more scarce and private sector is a bit more hesitant. True, though, and, and I think very understandable due to the risk which are out there. And, and so all what we do there is public-private partnership. Now, uh, what has been critical success factors is, I think, in finding the right partners who share with us the understanding of what is the problem which we want to tackle, for example, energy efficiency, for us finding the partners means having the opportunity identifying private sector players in the countries. Mostly on our side for energy efficiency projects, this goes through banking sectors. Having the partners who set up together a fund structure, like it can be a GCF and other players, of course, in that field who have interest in the climate uh, finance topic, who say either we are willing to scale up, very important, I think, when it comes to climate, or we are willing to de-risk certain solutions. And then, of course, having also uh, the outreach to private sector players who say, look, if this is all in place, we see actually that a very specific also impact can be achieved. For example, 25, 30% energy or emissions reduction in each single project. Then bringing all of this together, I think, and there's companies like us and others are needed to bring all these players together. Because I mean, in all clearness and fairness also, it's difficult to bring the different parties who have an overarching same objective but when it comes to the nitty gritties, of course, they have different conditions uh, attached to their uh, investments. And so we have, as a company, have to bring all these players together. And I would say the success really is in having a clear idea of something which is scalable, because if it's not scalable, then I think we always will have trouble, so to say, to bring in the private sector not, of course, when I talk about smaller solutions and you get foundations in some of the smaller foundations I'm, I'm, I'm referring here to, which is very good, but, you know, really to scale this up um, and to bring pension funds in, insurance companies, there I think it's very important to have topics uh, where, you know, we know we can scale that up and we identified the right partners. I, I stop here, Henry, for, for, for a second. Yes. But uh, but that is, you know, I could go, of course, to our different solutions. And uh, just the last sentence there. What is interesting and our learning also has been over those 10 years is that the roles which different parties, and I'm referring right now to public sector, private sector, which they play in each of those solutions is not always the same. For example, we have some solutions where the private sector takes actually higher risk because they are interested in the more, let's say from their perspective, risk return profile, which is provided. And the public sector actually is more for scaling. And we have also a solution where it's vice versa, where really the public sector institution or multilaterals or specialized entity or like, like your fund like yours, where they take really the risk or they de-risk and then the private sector comes on top of that. Just very important and last, I mean, for us to be really effective, very often what is needed is also technical assistance. So it, a lot of things we do, and here, of course, we are really small scale on the ground, you know, probably the most difficult things to do. And there very often, either for a financial institution, it's needed yet to understand how do I measure energy efficiency? It has to be efficient. So we, we run there our own software program to help these institutions to do that. Or when it comes to just com more complicated like adaptation issues that the companies themselves don't know, of course, sometimes what the solution is. Here, it's very important again to find the right partners who also can bring up then, let's say some pockets of money which allow us also to provide technical assistance because we all know uh, that's something which it all, if it all has to come out of the same fund, just the economics gets very complicated. Rose, if I may, just to go a little deeper on the adaptation, because you mentioned that towards the end, and I think that's sort of a new sector where you are entering. Um, adaptation is only getting like 5% of all the capital yes. flows that is going into climate finance. How are you somehow structuring that? And give us maybe a little bit of, of your early findings on yeah. that journey. 
we are only, and that's true. So, and I think it's also, it doesn't come so much, Henry, as a surprise, I would say, personally, because mitigation, I think it's, it, it's clearer to see where to invest and, and, and what to achieve when it comes to adaptation. And, you know, we, we enter the topic specifically through agriculture. Now, um, or sustainable food, as we sometimes say. And that is one, one big thing is we are already financing smallholder farmers or structures along the agriculture value chain for more than 10 years. Now, our big advantage is we already have contact to companies in, the, you know, in these countries. If you don't have that, it gets very you know, complicated because first you have to see now having contact to these companies already for a long time, we know or our you know, investment officers, the people who work with the companies see actually the opportunity for certain adaptation in processes or technology, which actually could help specifically smallholder farmers to better actually um, act then in an environment which is going to change. And we are using that type of, uh, so to say, advantage or using the synergies which we have there to make it happen. Because we all know, um, you know, that this, is more, this is more complicated because also sometimes it's less standardized than when you think about mitigation solutions, for example, energy efficiency, um, yeah, um, still an issue, many different solutions there. It's more about writing the partners for scaling it up, which we do through the banking sector. Thank you very much, Rahus. Thanks a lot. Uh, we now well, are you. gonna move uh, from the private sector perspective of an impact uh, asset manager to a regional development bank. And here, Kabay has been uh, a good partner with GCF since 2016, when you were accredited, Dr. Mossi. Um, you've partnered with GCF on several transactions, both adaptation and mitigation. Um, and based on that experience, I would like to you know, ask you what else is needed from a funding capacity or from a, or from a technical you know, readiness? What else would, would need, especially in your region, to attract more private capital into your transactions? Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity and uh, thank you for GCF being a great partner to us. Uh, uh, let me start by saying, uh, Henry, that I think the, the key factor uh, towards this engagement with GCF and attracting the private sector is to prepare projects in a smart way. And in that sense, I think uh, Cabe has been lucky that we already uh, had a preparation fund, which was uh, strengthened by the support from GCF. So projects are actually more ready to actually go into funding proposals. And uh, that's true for the really big projects to the small projects. Let me just give you an example. Uh, we are working with uh, Costa Rica in the electric train of San Jose. That require about, you know, funding for about $2 million in preparation funds. And uh, actually when the project was prepared and uh, we started chatting with UCF, we had a a really ready project that um, you know uh, we could convince uh, GCF, we could convince investors that this is a worldwide project and not only it makes sense for San Jose, Costa Rica and Costa Rica per se, but it also made sense in terms of uh, uh, you know avoiding emissions. Uh, so that's a big project, but also in the smaller scale, I think it's very important that uh, with GCF we actually engage with. Uh, uh, some uh, credit facility for small and medium enterprises on how to actually engage in resilient infrastructure and uh, uh, such as pumping water with electric, uh, with solar power uh, electric pumps, uh, how to build dams, how to use electric vehicles. And uh, so using the opportunity that created, was created by the pandemic, so we can actually help them with a second loan, but engage them in innovation. And uh, but all this is possible because we do have the possibility to provide technical assistance, but technical assistance in the sense of preparing the project. Uh, and first of all, second is to actually how to make use of this technology in a better way. So. Uh, Coming back to your question, how is it that uh, we actually practice uh, what we, we, we preach is by providing financing to the private sector, showing them there's a good business case for what uh, 
this transformation they're about to do. So now we are on electric mobility. We are pushing also for the use of hybrid or electric cars. So we're making the case to the private sector that this makes sense, not only in the sense of uh, buying cars that will have a reduced consumption of, of oil, but also that uh, it makes sense because it protects the environment. As you know, Central America uh, produces very little uh, gas emissions um, you know, linked to climate change, but every year about this season, we get a couple of hurricanes. Uh, so we do know uh, that we need to be responsible. We need to be at least responsible for our part in reducing this, uh, this contribution. So we need to adapt. Uh, there's nothing we can do against hurricanes. And uh, so we are actually taking from the big business to the small business. And, uh, and lastly, I just wanted to add that uh, one of the key factors that is helping us is to bring uh, the attention that climate change is an issue that is cross-cutting. It affects big business, affects governments, but it also affects smallholder uh, farmers. So uh, with the recent approval, so thank you, of the um, uh, dry corridor uh, approval, we actually are engaging with the poorest people that suffer uh, climate change in the worst. I mean, droughts during the summer, floods during the winter time. So uh, with this opportunity to have water available all year long for consumption and also for production uh, of food is actually uh, is a key ingredient on, on uh, fighting poverty. And lastly, I don't want to uh, leave this opportunity. We're also engaging in the blue economy uh, in the Pacific coast, Gulf of Fonseca. I think it's a very rich region, yet there's a lot of poor people. So uh, we are actually taking care of the resources that we do not, do not see from, from above, which is uh, how the sea life uh, is to be preserved and how do we avoid trash to getting into, into the water? Uh, how do we keep this environment pristine? So, um, you know, uh, there's, there have been attempts of having industrial fishing in this area, and governments have been resisting the temptation for easy money to go into this business. And uh, so we are supporting how to preserve these natural environments, and uh, hopefully uh, very soon you will have a a blue bond coming from Cave to finance these investments that are actually important in near the coast to uh, ensure that the water resource is actually uh, helping to uh, enhance the environment, not the other way around. So uh, very excited on engaging with the private sector. Government cannot do everything. And in, on, on top of this crisis, which left many governments with a lot of debt, so it's essential that the private sector uh, comes to share the burden of these investments. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mosi. Thank you. It's been a great partnership with GCF as well, indeed. Um, let us now switch to, to Anita. And Anita, as, as working for an asset owner and for an important asset owner that holds the pensions of, of many uh, Quebecois, um, I would like to somehow you know, ask you, as a long-term global investor, CDPQ plays a, a key role in limiting the impacts of climate change. It deployed its first climate strategy back in 2017, even before all the pledges started coming, um, setting ambitious targets to take quick and structured action. What has been the, pro the progress so far and what challenges remain outstanding to go to innovate and meet climate change or climate challenge further? Love to hear a little bit, what are those challenges? And I know you just recently relaunched a new strategy refresh in 2021. So if you can walk us a little bit, because Rohus mentioned that bringing investors like you into some of these transactions is key for scaling, but it's not always so easy. Love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, Henry. And it's really a pleasure to be here with all of my fellow panelists and with you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, CDPQ, you know, what we joke internally is that we have uh, really been climate conscious and ESG conscious in our DNA. So we've been involved for a very long time, in fact, starting with the principles of responsible investment. And then more recently in 2017, when we set targets. So you mentioned uh, on the progress, and here I would like to 
bring in a very important element to the progress, which is that we tied our remuneration of, for all of us investment teams to our performance on the targets that we set for ourselves. And we had targets in terms of reducing the energy intensity of our portfolio, uh, target for doing more green investments. And um, we also had an unsaid target of stewardship, of bringing others, other long-term institutional investors like ourselves. So I'm very happy to say that uh, I don't know if it's just because of the incentives, because I do believe that all of us are very committed to meeting these targets. Uh, we have increased our, we've exceeded performance on every single target that we set. So we decided that in 2021, we needed to have a refresh because the urgency of addressing climate change has gone up exponentially. Uh, we felt that given our experience and all the lessons we had learned from our 2017 endeavors, that we could actually dare to be much more ambitious. And so we've set uh, five different areas to work in. One is to actually uh, in reduce our carbon intensity of invested dollars to, by 60% from 2017, and we will achieve this in 2030. Uh, we have also said that our green investments, which we had hoped to double, has actually we've ended up trebling. And so those will go up another three times to 54 billion by 2025. Uh, we, along with several others, as you know, are part of the Net Zero Alliance uh, to achieve net zero by 2050. And most recently in 2021, we added a transition finance of 10 billion to help us help industries in the most uh, carbon emitting sectors like steel, lithium, cobalt, cement, etc. Um, we also announced, which was, uh, you know, I think um, something where we are still being asked a lot of questions to get out of the oil producing sector by 2022. So that's not too far off. And last but not least, our efforts on stewardship, where we are co-leading the investor leadership network. We are 15 institutional investors with 9 trillion under management. All of us have committed to having carbon uh, emission reduction targets, green investment targets, and that we will publicly uh, share these and we would be verified by third parties on our performance. Uh, the second is equally important for us on diversity, equity and inclusion. And we've already put into action some of our demands on our investee companies, uh, especially listed companies to have diversity and inclusion at the board level and management level and at the shareholder level. And uh, last but not least is creating infrastructure capacity in emerging markets. And this is also, I think, very important as economies are trying to build back uh, to make sure that we bring in the capacity to have green infrastructure as we build back. So uh, answering your question, Henry, in terms of, uh, you know, how can we come in more into, especially emerging markets, I would say that there is a lot of appetite. So we have, in fact, increased our emerging market exposure from 5% of our uh, assets under management uh, to 15%. So we have about 45 billion invested in emerging markets. And so far, I would say we have gone in where uh, we, the, we have found good partners and we have focused on brownfield assets. But as we are getting to know these new geographies, we are setting up platforms that aggregate assets like renewable energy, for example, uh, or e-mobility platforms, where we are actually now 
also started financing greenfield assets. I think the big push for us uh, to do this in a manner which is uh, across the globe would be to have the catalyzing help of GCF and others like responsibility uh, to uh, help us get more familiar with emerging markets and I would say even frontier markets that we are less uh, um, informed about and where the risks are much higher. You also spoke of uh, mitigation versus adaptation and that's an area where we are also working on and we do this especially through the filter of risk assessment where now uh, the climate impact for every single one of our investments is explicitly taken into account and adaptation measures to address those risks are being put into place alongside our investments by our investee companies or our partners and, and we work side by side with them. Thank you very much, Anita, and congratulations to CDPQ for the sustainable leadership it's uh, undertaken. And I think what you mentioned is at the heart of what we've been discussing, and that is how to, how to find these trusted relationships that we can somehow come together, you know, the field experience of a responsibility, the quality capital of a GCF, the regional expertise of a CABE, the advisory expertise of a Delphos. This is a little bit what we are trying to have these exchanges. Thank you so much. Um, allow me now to, to ask our, our very own CFO, Hong. Um, uh, Hong, GCF um, has been, you know, focused on private sector investments right from the start. And about one third of the total commitments of GCF up to now is indeed linked to private sector, about around 9 billion um, in, with co-investments, about 3 billion from our capital, around 9 billion with co-investments. However, in this first, let's say ramp up phase, the bulk of our investments are in senior loans, grants, and a lot in the energy space and mitigation. How can you see, you know, GCF use its limited financial capacity to really be more catalytic as it aims to unlock more capital in climate investments. Thanks, thanks Henry, and thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I think um, Anita's comments sings to my um, CFO heart in terms of looking towards uh, GCF um, to, to help on um, them um, move forward in some of the markets that have been a little bit more difficult in investments um, that can be quite difficult for, for private sector. Um, so I guess I guess one thing, I mean, you and I have had um, sidebar conversations about the the, the naming of this um, of this session. And I really took, I, I think a little bit of um, you know injected a little bit of shock into, into the team when I said, I, I don't like this title. It talks about de-risking and we really are not about de-risking. And, and I think if I just wanna you know, dive a little bit deeper there, I think that you know, we heard it from Rojos, we heard it from Dr. Mosi, we heard it from Anita, that a lot of the private sector, what they're paid to do is actually take risk. The question is, how do we lower that hurdle so that it becomes an attractive um, model, that it becomes an attractive project for, for the private sector to come in. And so for me, the de-risking is probably a misnomer a bit. It's really about understanding what those hurdle levels are. And it does obviously um, vary depending on who you're dealing with, which countries you're dealing with, the type of investments. But it, you know, the private sector is there to make money on, on um, on risk, on taking positions. So, so I, I think that you know, for us, um, and I know I'm being a little bit roundabout about this, but as you know, the way I look at GCF is that we are an investor. We, we have very similar, you know, um, mandates uh, because we we work on a partnership model. And the way I think about it is, for private sector, they really need to worry about their balance sheet, balance sheet usage and think about you know, capital adequacy, think about LCRs, et cetera, et cetera. But for us, 
we constantly talk about how we are capital agnostic. And that, that's exciting for me coming from private sector into GCF. It really opens up the field for us in terms of what we can do. But one thing I do wanna highlight is that just because we're capital agnostic doesn't mean that you know, it's, it's, it's free um, because you know, the, the funding is finite. And, and when I look across even the multilaterals, the MDBs, the international organizations, their balance sheets are, are finite as well. Um, I was doing a little bit of research before this panel um, just to try and get a little bit of statistics. But if you look at ADB, AFDB, IDB, IBRD's um, balance sheet, their headroom sits at about three, 400 billion, let's call it 380 billion. Um, but if you layer in their capital adequacy requirements, it goes down to about 80 billion. And so, we're, but we're looking at a trillion dollar problem per annum. So it's just not sufficient uh, that, that capital, our capital, the multilaterals capital is just not sufficient without the support of private sector. And, and we've all heard of that, you know, that wall of cash that's just waiting to be deployed. But that's really where we can address the, the issues um, that, we're, that we're facing. Um, so I guess, you know, how do we attract that? Um, and, and you did ask me to talk about it from my, uh, from my CFO perspective. But I do, look at, I do look at these programs and I think about how do we you know, how do we position ourselves most efficiently, um, you know, harking back on that comment that our capital is finite, our, you know, what we can do is finite, and we have to be really selective in terms of the programs and the impact they'll have. So, um, so, so speaking to your comment about us being loan heavy, um, mitigation heavy, I, I think, you know, what we're moving towards is really trying to figure out, well, how can we be a little bit innovative and, um, and what, what can we do to attract that private capital? So uh, junior equity positions, I think, are, uh, are a, a little bit of the unsung hero. I, I think that while we, we take on these junior equity positions, what um, it allows things that would not otherwise happen you know, that senior capital would not come in without us taking that, that additional risk um, because everybody wants that senior position, but nobody's willing to take that junior position. So that's where we can come in. Um, and then obviously uh, guarantees. I, I think that that also attracts some of the um, conversation that are the points that Anita made in terms of looking at frontier markets. You know, how can we come in and really, um, manage the risks and, and the biggest pieces of risk. Um, I do think that, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit glib about the de-risking. There's components that we that we do need to remove um, and that's where we can come in. Um, I guess I'll just briefly go through a couple of examples just to, just to um, underscore some of, the, uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I would say that the um, Global Fund for Coral Reefs, um, I'm really excited to say we, we just had that approved by the board. Um, and, and so um, I'm really excited to see that, that launch at some point. But that's a really great example of um, some of the things that uh, um, I was excited to hear Dr. Mosi talk about, which is uh, uh, the blue economy. So this one is uh, an adaptation fund. Um, it it um, works on eco-based system solutions. Um, and so it really is just cutting edge. Um, and this is where we, um, we participated through an investment window. Um, and, um, and, and that's where we're, we're really um, bringing in some of the, um, some of the funding that, um, that we should see. Um, so it's been uh, it's been a really uh, tough ride, but the but the fund size is proposed at about half a million dollars. Our financing is is one and a quarter, and so you can see where it's at least three times that we're that we're bringing in. So that's that's a really exciting example. The other one that I would say is really nice is the Global Subnational Climate Fund, which is pretty exciting as well. Um, and so that one um, we are. Um, working through a couple of, of layers as well. But again, you know, we've got um, a portion of a grant facility, we've got a portion of the equity components. And so that's going to be um, quite interesting as well. Um, so, so those are examples of where we do use uh, our junior equity positions to attract, um, uh, attract private capital. Thank you very much, Hong. 
it's always uh, great having you in the investment committees and hearing uh, some of these important criteria when we present projects. And I think that's sort of part of, of, the, of the internal learning. So thanks a lot for being uh, vocal and, and, and a good leader on those fronts. Uh, Victoria, uh, before Delphos, you have been an investor in emerging markets and you've been working a lot in the financial services. But perhaps with that experience, uh, especially on the advisory side in emerging markets with a very strong footprint in infrastructure, um, what are the most salient challenges that persist uh, that perhaps represent important bottlenecks to allow more private capital to flow into some of these developing countries for climate investments? And a lot of this could be private debt and private equity. Love to hear your thoughts and, and how can we mitigate some of those? Thank you, Henry, and thank you very much for having me on this panel with uh, such distinguished other participants as well. Um, being, being last as a panelist, I've had the benefit of hearing uh, for, for, from everybody else, and there are so many common strands here when we come to the challenges of, of investing and bringing private capital into more challenging jurisdictions and marketplaces. I really wanted to echo a couple of the key themes that I think everyone has touched upon. Um, Hong talked about the trillion dollar challenge and really mobilizing capital in a, in a meaningful way. Um, uh, Anita, I think, touched on a $9 trillion number, which was um, a relatively small, uh, less than 10 asset managers together um, represent. And uh, Rockus had talked all, also about scalability and the ability to um, really leverage ideas. So I, I, I wanted to come back to this. I, I'd spent uh, the most of the last 25 years working in capital markets and looking at ways to mobilize um, capital in relatively large scale into challenging markets and into, into products and, uh, and into infrastructure projects specifically in emerging markets. I want to. I think if we could deliver a combination, and this is obviously what GCF is is extremely focused on, of these very powerful enabling products, the junior equity um, that that Hong touched on, that maybe can take on some of the the really challenging political or cross border risks that it's hard for other private investors to take on alongside some powerful element of standardization, then we can really start to make a difference. Um, just to give you an example, when I started working in emerging market bond markets back in, um, in the mid nineties, I think the level of emerging market corporate bond issuance then was between on a, on a good year between 10 and $20 billion a year. That's what 25 years ago. In 2020, despite all the challenges of the pandemic, there was $500 billion issued by EM corporates. That, that market has exploded. There was another $230 um, billion of sovereign issuance. So there was close to a trillion dollars of bond issuance, long-term capital markets financing provided by offshore investors into emerging markets in 2020, into a very challenging year, almost a trillion dollars. There's over $120 trillion of um, bond market issuance um, and bond products outstanding in the market. We only need a tiny fraction of that to be pulled into emerging markets, but we look at the success factors, and that has been a high level of standardization, standardization in contracts, secondary market liquidity, um, formats for, for trading, protections from um, international laws, English law, some, some standardization of um, bankruptcy, um, uh, rules and enforcement rights 
under tricky scenarios. But that's been a tremendous catalyst to pull long-term investment into emerging markets. And I think I wanted to underscore what both Hong and Anita um, echoed, which was there is risk appetite by the market to take risk in emerging markets. There are private capital markets set up to do that. When I look at EM projects, I think of the macro risk um, and the, the country risk, the market risk as one tenant, and then there is the political risk, and then there is the project risk, the execution risk. And it's really those two that are really hard for the private sector to take, especially in uh, uh, across such a myriad range of projects. Um, and I think if we can work with multilateral sources and and with local local um, national governments as well to address those, if we can work um, with, um, with 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 some of the, the the DFI community who already have fantastic political risk products, but potentially to standardise those a little bit more, if we can work with national governments to standardize just withholding tax. That is a big obstacle to have. If we had a standardized withholding tax treatment for qualifying infrastructure projects um, and climate transition projects in emerging markets, that would broaden the pool of investors. And then if in parallel, we can use some of these catalytic first loss um, uh, uh, products, if we can use some of the fantastic PRI products, if we can use more innovative hedging that is supported by official sector um, sources, if we can be a little bit more innovative, maybe around some of the basic um, but real structural obstacles, whether bringing, uh, whether it's a, a, a CLO type of solution that can be supported on a broader scale by the official sector to translate loan risk and address the delayed draw issues that you see in emerging markets to get that into a more bond market type of products, then I think um, we, we can really make a difference. And these are solutions that can be scaled up as well, so they can address a lot of the challenges that we see in uh, small island states where get, the scale of getting to market can be prohibitive because of some of the uh, complexity in projects that can't be addressed in a, in a very um, cost-efficient way. Um, but we're at, we're at the start, relatively early in the start of a journey, and I think we have to remind ourselves of that sometimes. It took us 25 years to get there um, in emerging markets. Infrastructure globally is a relatively new asset class that probably only emerged in the, the format that we see in developed markets in the last 15 to 20 years. Not that infrastructure projects haven't been happening or haven't been funded, but they were in the past typically financed in a relatively standardized way by the local banking sector. That's that's unlikely to happen going forward. And that scale of the pendulum has really switched to the capital markets in terms of the, the depths and tenors that are available there. So I think we always need to keep our, our capital markets hats on when we think about solutions um, and uh, bring these wonderful enabling products in, in as standardized a way as possible, along more standardized contracts that can help pull in um, that, that risk capital that, that, that absolutely exists and as there's greater allocations into emerging markets, which is a trend that we see um, globally from, from insurance companies and pension firms worldwide, then we'll be very well positioned to capitalise on that. I know these are, these are easy solutions to prescribe, <laughs> um, more challenging to implement. We're going to need a lot of coordination, creativity, flexibility. But I, I, I do think we're at um, the start of a journey and I do think we will, we, you know, we, we should focus, we should think big and expect to deliver big. Thank you very much, Victoria. I think you provide us with good perspective on, on how early in the journey we are and how much 
we can still go. Um, and it was great that you brought the importance of thinking about solutions that are applicable to the least developed countries, to the SIDS, the small island development states, and also to you know everybody else. So I think that is really, really important. Um, now I'm gonna bring some questions from, from the audience because there's been quite a lot of activity as everybody has been speaking. So I will be addressing a few questions to some of you. Um, this is a question to Rojos. Uh, Rojos, um, it's a pragmatic question in the sense that when you are structuring climate finance and you talk about scalability, how straightforward is the process? Uh, how, are, how quick is it to bring that idea into action? Any examples or any thoughts from your responsibility? Perhaps Rare comes to mind if I may say something, oh. uh, but you can bring any other example. Uh, uh, let, let me know. I, I don't think about it's in general. Look, we have been structuring a handful of climate focused um, initiative solutions. And I mentioned before, and all of them are blended finance. And I would like to link this to commentary Victoria just uh, the, the word I like most is standardization here. The, the point is scaling up. Look, scaling up. We all talk about it. We, we, we all know it's needed. But Definitely, the reality is that um, to be very good at scaling up something, a high degree of standardization would be needed, which is currently not in place from all the parties. And there's good reason from everybody. Huh? I'm not criticizing. I'm just describing what the reality is. So if you ask me, how long does it take? My answer is too long, <laughs> much too long. I mean, a project from an idea to getting started, to be very frank, setting up a fund, it might take us two to three years to, to do this. Now, you might say, Rojos, this is very fast, but <laughs> I think it's, it's given the challenges we have, it's, it, it takes too long. And it takes long because people like, you know, we like talking about standard, we, uh, we, we, we like talking scaling up, but when it comes in, so, hey, you have to compromise, you have to give up something because it's standardized. My experience is most parties will know, but I have my rules. And my rules tell me I have to do this. And that's all fine. But I think there is a challenge. And I would like to make one last comment, which I personally find, you know, like innovation is very important. And, and it has been mentioned also, and I, and I know, for example, also Henry, the, you know, GC, you know, to your institution and many other, of course, you look for and you, through your role also. But of course, there is between innovation sometimes and scaling something up and the time needed, there might be a trade off. For tackling the problems out there, it's not only about innovation. Innovation is very important, you know, it's crucial, but it's also about, hey, Certain things are known, but we just have to do it. And all the point made from legal framework, tax issues, standardization requirements of different multilateral governments, just accepting, keep it relatively simple to scale it up. That would be my overall recommendation. I would love to see this, you know, but, um, but um, we try our best, yeah? but it takes short, too long. Thank you, Rahos. Indeed, it's a, it's a long process. So we're on the same page sometimes here on our end as well. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Dante, um, you were talking about the uh, inclusion of the private sector. And the question here is how, how much appetite is there from, from, from local, national, regional investors to start co-investing with some of your projects? There seems to be a big appetite from you know, global investors of the North, but there is also asset owners in the global South that should engage. How, how are you seeing that when you are trying to, you know, bring private capital into some of your uh, blended projects? Look, uh, what, I, what we have found here in Central America is that the, the appetite is there when you actually make the business case for it. And uh, it also has to do with the scale. I mean, uh, I, I come back to the first question when I hear billions and, um, in Central America, it's more about less than that. And uh, the scale is actually much smaller. And uh, one of our objectives is go to actually to the small holder. And uh, for that, uh, you know, I find that technical assistance is key to show the benefits of new technologies, uh, to adapting green and more sustainable technologies. 
it actually entices private sector to come in. Um, I mean, private sector, uh, local private sector might not be humongous in terms of uh, dollar sign. Yet it's crucial uh, to bring it, uh, to provide sustainability to these uh, new ideas. So in that sense, I think, you know, it works as for the big investor as well. Come with a clear case uh, in which you actually show that it makes sense for your pocket. And it also makes sense for uh, the environment. So uh, when you actually make the case, uh, it's very easy. And uh, one of these examples is that uh, we are actually uh, working with, uh, you know, smallholder farmers uh, in the dry corridor and the private sector, uh, uh, in this case, banks, uh, they're actually coming with us. Uh, I mean, we're using their local channels of distribution to engage with clients and provide loans with, uh, you know, the right tools, like, uh, you know, to mention one of them, uh, a guarantee fund. Uh, to ensure that the, uh, the the farmers which have never had access to credit can become credit worthy, and uh, so with these um, instruments, we're actually engaging with private sector. But the thing I want to tell you is we're upscaling this. Uh, you know, we are going uh, uh, with friends as Korea and Spain uh, and the GCF as well to actually engage in larger investment funds that are actually uh, from Korea. I mean, which is, it's the North as well, but they're coming with big bucks uh, to uh, invest in trains because they are convinced uh, electric trains are actually good for the region, good for the environment. And in the process, uh, I, I will tell you that virtually every investment, uh, retirement fund of the Central American region wants to join in. And they said that we want to become a part of this effort. So um, bottom line, uh, preparation and technical assistance are essential uh, to prepare the project and how to implement and communicate what the project is doing and accomplishing both in terms of financial terms and environmental terms. So uh, th that will be my answer. Thank you, Dr. Dante. Keep up the great work. Anita, uh, there's a question about how can traditional asset managers be incentivized to sponsor new funds in the climate space? Uh, what role do you think GCFs can play in this? Any wisdom to share there? I think that's a fantastic question and a big thank you to whoever asked it, uh, because I think, uh, you know, there are the large projects, the already scaled up platforms like renewable energy, which is becoming more mainstream. But I think a lot of the issues that we still have to address will come through certain technology uh, solutions as Dr. Dante was mentioning just now. I think uh, Rochus also uh, alluded to that. And to use technology to bring down costs and enable scale up is something that we at CDPQ, for example, believe in. And so we have the two ends of the spectrum. We are very active in the large um, platforms, but we are also very active in venture funds, in supporting uh, climate funds. Uh, in fact, most recently, we just invest, uh, invested in one called Energized Ventures, which is looking at venture solution, uh, technology solutions in the energy transition segment. And I think this is very, very key. The reason I say this is because when you have, if you look at the evolution of venture capital, private equity was the more established, going for the more established companies. But the kind of dynamism, innovation, creativity, and problem solving that venture funds have been able to support, I think is something else. Again, uh, I'm, you know, there is a lot of competition across the globe and there is a lot of green technology funds and all the huge SPAC mania that's happening in the developed markets and for developing and emerging markets to compete for those same dollars becomes more challenging. Uh, but that's where I see GCF, and others like responsibility, uh, being able to catalyze and bring those some of those uh, venture capital uh, into emerging markets. 
Thank you, Anita. Thank you very much. Hong, I would like you, I would like for you to give your reaction to a comment that I think was someone in agreement with you. Um, and the comments reads as follows. We must move the conversation away from risk assessment towards opportunity assessment, which incorporates positive values and valuation beyond negative risk criteria. The future looks very different with this lens. Agree with Hong. Can she comment on this? Thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Henry. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I do agree on that, and um, I, I think um, Rohus actually probably stated it a little bit more eloquently than I did. I, I think when we look at, at least from GCF and you know, sitting in the investment committees, when we do look at things, it, it's it's interesting. There there used to be this kind of concept of a full cost versus incremental cost, and how much are we going to invest and what portion of that are we going to invest and and the concept of it is really to say okay well you know if you if you um spend this much more money then actually it will be a much more energy efficient or more green or reduce you know uh ghg emissions and so the portion that that um that 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 cost differential um, is, is what you know, we're actually trying to cover so that that can bring in you know, the, um, the new technology, for example. And you know, that, that now has changed to, there's a potential that it's negative incremental cost. And I think that that's where we can come in, where we're investing early you know, Anita talked about some of the venture capital, but, you know, this is where incubators come in and really thinking about how do we convert, you know, some of these opportunities to, to on a long-term basis, become actually scalable, actually investable. And without us coming in and, and doing that, I think that that's where it, there, there's, there's real loss of, of putting some really great opportunities um, to, to the side. Um, but I, I, absolutely agree with it. I think that, you know, for private side, um, and I know I'm, I'm going a little off topic, but for private side, it's a question of, you know, how do we get more of the investors to think about that adjustment that Anita talks about? Like, how do you get them to think about, well, you know, it's not necessarily that uh, some of this innovative uh, um uh, some of these innovative ideas are expensive, but that we've underpriced the risk and the impact that traditional um, traditional um, uh, technology is is has continues to create. And so I think that that's where you know absolutely totally agree with that one. Thank you, Hong. We're almost reaching the end, but I cannot leave without asking Victoria a last question as well. Uh, Victoria, uh, uh, from the from the audience, they would like to um, know. You talked about capital market solutions, and we should not forget those. Uh, what capital market product could be deployed to recycle capital that can continue coming to climate finance? So this whole idea you already talked a little bit about securitization, but any other ideas on recycling capital? I, I mean, I uh, we're talking about recycling. Well, I guess there are two ways of recycling capital. There's a recycling of capital from successful products. Investors get paid back and that gets redeployed. And then there's also, which kind of comes back to the, the previous question about opportunity, uh, investors can come in relatively early into greenfield projects. They can invest. And as those projects reach maturity, as they reach commercial operation, that capital can then be recycled again from a risk perspective. Uh, uh, there are some very interesting vehicles that have been put together, uh, I know, that uh, are able to recycle capital between early stage and late stage in-house between a, um, a number of different products. I think this is something that the, mar the market doesn't, that is what the market does it recycled capital and that's why I focused on having standardized products that can offer secondary market liquidity because with that ability to recycle through secondary trading comes investor confidence and investor willingness to take more risk as well. Thank you very much. Financial sector development is key in all of this. I wish we had another hour or more to continue this conversation. It's been very rich 
I really appreciate your candor, your commitment, uh, your passion. Uh, but you know, we're coming to the end of this session. And uh, on behalf of GCF and uh, all of my colleagues, I would like to thank you very much for your interest and participation. We invite you all to visit our website at greenclimatefund.com events to learn about this event and other passing upcoming GCF events. We would like to thank the organizing team at the GCF and the interpreters who supported us, us today. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.